Last week, uh, we talked about giving, that our, our giving uh, should be done in secret, but in accordance to the generous nature of our Heavenly Father. This week, we're going to continue to talk about giving. And I was thinking about this the last week, I confessed how my family, Rachel and Jennifer, outgive me with compassion all the time. There's another aspect of our life that sometimes they'll joke with me about. So we like to, who likes to share, you share snacks or share food with people? Anybody like to share food with people? A few people, maybe. What? Is it a food that I like? Food, right? So like, maybe you go to Chick-fil-A, and you get, you get those beautiful waffle fries and that good sandwich, right? And, you, and every once in a while, you make the decision, well, I'm not that hungry, so why don't you get a large, and I'll share fries with people. But then it comes down to the last fry. <laughs> and you have to, like, fight over who's going to get the last fry. And... And it happens all the time where I will, I will offer to share things with people, or often, no, not so much, I will ask other people to share things with me. But then when people want to ask me for my waffle fry from Chick-fil-A, I will almost always say no. Confession of the pastor. Almost oh, always say no. Or you get some M&M's with penis in them. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not, I'm not, you're just not getting a piece of my M&M's with penis in it. That's okay. Those are mine. But if you have some chocolate that you got from school and you bring it home, it is 100%. Fair game. Or pastors would take it. That's a big part of it. I, think I kind of mentioned this, but sometimes it's a struggle when we are asked to give or when we see a need and we want to give, we want to take part in it, but there's only a, a certain amount or a certain part that we want to respond. I kind of told the humorous part of when we walk on State Street and Denver wants to help out people and he's always asking, Dad, are you, are you going to help out? And every once in a while I'll challenge him, Denver, what are you going to do? He's like, oh no, I'm saving up for that next Lego set. You know, he, he, he wants to help at times and there's needs that we see and we want to meet them, but often we are uh, unwilling to share or to give when it's going to cost us something. Uh, in the scriptures, we're going to see that Jesus often challenges this part of who we are. This desire of his to get to the heart of who we are uh, often uh, gets me. In Mark chapter 10, <coughs> 17 through 22, we find a story of a rich young ruler, a rich, yeah, rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and uh, his question that he has in his heart is, how much are you asking me to give? What is it, what is it going to cost me, Jesus, to follow you? So let's look at this. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 22, says this. And as he was sitting out, setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear fault witnesses, 
Do not defraud. Honor your mother, your father and your mother. And he said to them, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. As I have confessed a few times from this stage, that I love following rules. I could identify with this rich young man coming for Jesus, asking, hey, what is it going to cost me that I would enter into the kingdom of heaven? And he would list as Jesus, just as he did to this rich young uh, man here, he, he tells him, oh, here are the rules, here are the commands, these are the things from God, but you already know these things. And of course, the rich man, young man, and maybe even to me sometimes, I could say, yeah, you know, I, I followed the rules. Anybody in here? I, I got it. Yeah, I'm pretty good. But Jesus, just as he has been doing in the Sermon on the Mount, he continues to do every time Jesus speaks. He goes beyond just what we can accomplish on our own and it goes to the very heart of who we are. Knowing this young man, I love it, it says this, and Jesus, looking at him, he loved him. <clears throat> Ever been in a situation where you have to give a, a hard word to somebody, and, but you know that you, you love them, you, you, you have to say what is, what is right. And Jesus, he looks at this young man, he, he, he loves him, and he's, he knows that there's something deeper in his heart than just the following of the rules. You lack one thing. Here Jesus encapsulates this moment with this rich young man. And he's really getting at the heart that though he has followed the rules and the regulations, the standards of what it would mean to be a, a good person, he knew that his possessions possessed him. Lack like one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasures in heaven. Come follow me. Jesus is an expert at speaking to the heart, speaks to this young man where his heart has been captured by the things that he has, the value that they have, the influence that they enable him to have, and he he speaks to them and says, sell it all and give to the poor. One of the things that I've been examining over the last couple of weeks as I studied in the Sermon on the Mount, talking about giving to the needy and giving in private, is, is I've been examining my heart and my <laughs> willingness to give abundantly. Because whether it is that last golden crispy waffle fry from Chick-fil-A, or it is the money that I have received in my life, or the possessions that I have in my home, oftentimes my goal in life is to preserve and get more, rather than think about how what I have been given has been given to me so that others may see the glory of the Father. I have to examine myself, or over the weeks, examine myself, continually have my possessions possess me. Now when we read these radical scriptures, uh, sometimes I get motivated, hey, let me sell everything. I get rid of all the cars, and 
get rid of all of my possessions. We'll go. Uh, I used to love talking with Britton while he was here. He's like, man, I would be satisfied to pack up my little bit of stuff in my car and just go travel the world and tell people about Jesus. Just live simply. This morning, I'm not here to tell you to sell everything and give it away. However, I want to encourage you to examine your heart and, and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you have your possession or the gaining of possessions possessed you. Here Jesus has spoken to this rich young man, speaking to his heart, sell everything. But I don't believe this is a mandate in Scripture that we would all have nothing. Because having enables giving. Jesus, our God, in his great wisdom, he, he gives us all things. I have to first recognize that. Everything that I own has been given to me by him. It's to be used for his glory, for a demonstration of how generous he was. Having enables us to give. In scripture, we see this principle over and over. Even Zacchaeus, right, the wicked man that he was, he didn't give away all that he had. He actually gave away half of what he had, but he gave away more than what he took. In Luke chapter 19, verse 8 and 9, right? And Jesus commends his generosity in that moment as a sign of his salvation. Hey, it's, it's clear, Jesus, it's clear that you have made the decision to follow me because of this act of generosity. In the New Testament in Acts, right, we saw people giving, selling possessions and, and giving up uh, all the things that they had so that they could provide for those who were in need. And, and Barnabas, he was one that was uh, he was one that was mentioned by name. He was mentioned as one that was an encourager in this. And, and it says that he sold just one field, one of his fields, in his act of generosity, so that others' needs could be met. Acts, that's found in Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and 37. Again, it's not, uh, the, it wasn't a habit of the early church or for the church to give up all that they had. In the Corinthian church, uh, Paul was encouraging the Corinthian church also to be people who give. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, verse 1 and 2, is what Paul says to the Corinthian church. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches in Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and store up as he may prosper, so there will be no collection when I come. So Paul would... <coughs> Paul would go around and establishing churches, and as he went along his missionary journey, he would establish a principle of giving them, where that as they, as they were, as they prospered, the first day of the week they would decide, okay, I'm going to give this portion aside. And so when Paul would make another missionary journey, he would come around for the collection. Then they would already have what they what they have stored up to give. They would already have it prepared, and he says he wouldn't have to he wouldn't have to take up a collection. You wouldn't have to, at that moment, all of a sudden, prompt people, okay, here, you're, let's pass the bucket around, let's give. No, they would already have prepared, out of the ways that they have prospered, uh, resources to give to the offering. But it was important that they continued to prosper. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, this uh, verse speaks to the fact that we should depend on no one. 
that our hands should find work to do. This isn't to say that those that do, uh, do find themselves in a place that they need to depend on others. It doesn't mean that they are cursed. It doesn't mean that they are unbiblical. However, <coughs> we are encouraged as followers of Jesus to be ones that put our hands to work. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says this, Aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before the outsider and be dependent on no one. We are to be people who work unto God. We are to be people that have. But our having must not possess us. Must not control us. God is aware of our need to pay bills, to create a life where we don't depend on others. Last, a uh, couple weeks ago, you guys got to meet a good friend of mine, and I want to encourage you to continue to pray for a gentleman named Ivan, who came into the sanctuary at the end of the sermon. He's been coming to the church for quite some time on a regular basis. I've gotten to know his story. Dad knew his story, and we've interacted with him on a regular basis, helping him make steps towards working with his hands, and providing for himself. But we know that God has also blessed us as a church, and he has blessed us to be a blessing. This is the heart of what it means to be a giver. This is what a, a, a heart, what it means to be a follower of Christ, that we have been blessed to be a blessing. That was at first and foremost, it was the, in recognition of salvation that we have received in Christ. We have been blessed with salvation. And so the things that we have been blessed with, just like Jesus told the disciples, freely you have received, freely give, go and pray and heal the sick and, and cast out demons and, and share the good news of Jesus Christ that he has saved us and, and made us whole. But it also here applies to the possessions that we have. We have been blessed to be a blessing. Not only is God aware of our need to pay bills, to create a life, and to provide for our families, He is also keenly aware that oftentimes our desire to have outweigh our desires to give. So today I want to hone in on Mark chapter 12 today. We're going to be looking at verses 41 through 44. He watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. 
And he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had. All she had to live on. Sure, if we got a, I'm sure if we got a scale out. Okay, weighing our offering probably don't feel bad. I'm sure if we got calculators out on Sunday morning and compared everybody's gifts, <laughs> couldn't even imagine doing this kind. There'd be some gifts that are different than others. But giving to God is not about percentages or amounts. I get, I get stuck on that, stuck up on that, stuck up on that, stuck up on that, stuck on that. <clears throat> I like to, uh, I like to count pennies. Uh, we went to Dave Ramsey, um, and uh, there's a little financial piece university. And in there, he makes a joke about two different personalities with finances. You got the, the, the penny pincher or, and the, the free spirit. And so they, they talk about the, the free spirit person. Just, they just go, they just spend, they get, you know, do their thing. And, and the penny pincher, he, they like to you know, calculate and make sure. And um, for, for us, when we went through that, and I'm not promoting or I'm not promoting the series, but well, while we went through that, it was really good for me because I was the one that was always uh, <laughs> counting, pen, uh, counting pennies, and so I was the one that was a little bit more, all right, stingy, okay, we can't give or we can't do that because we don't have, and then Rachel tended to be more of the free spirit in, in that moment, uh, and as we begin to calculate these things, uh, actually, I became to realize, oh, we actually do have more to give, and then uh, on the office side, Rachel said, oh, wow, I actually, I, we actually don't have uh, the extended amount. But we all often joke that if Rachel was completely involved in our finances, we would have zero in our bank account every month because she likes to just, uh, she, she has that just giving within her. But I have found as I studied and meditated on the Word of God, that giving is less about percentages and amounts as it is an act of worship signifying our dependence on God. When I was in uh, high school, I went to Atlanta, Georgia. And I went to the, uh, a homeless uh, ministry. And I found this interact the week that I was there, interacting with the people that were on, uh, that we were ministering to, that those that had nothing were often way more generous than I was willing to. They would help each other. They would help me. They would offer to give me things that they needed. Like it wasn't even. 
They would help each other out. They would they would go to life walking to to go to church. They would they they cared for each other's needs and and so it puzzled me. Why would you do these things? And there was a something that was revealed to me of their understanding of their dependence on God. This is the hardest thing when we when we get to a phase in life where we have or where we have or where our our work has now earned us places or positions or accolades or whatever it would be, that for some reason in our mind we've forgotten that our very breath, the very breath in our lungs depends on God's gift to us. And there's something about having nothing that requires you to depend on God in such a way that then when you do have little or some, you realize, oh, it's not even mine. I, I depended on God and He gave it to me. Now, what I have, I don't even need. It, it's not even, it doesn't even mean anything to me. It's worthless to me. And this is what is it, what is encapsulated in this young widow's two pennies. And this is what Jesus is highlighting about her gift. She gave everything. Some in this room had 10% of the challenge. Some of us, man, 30% ain't even touching anything. What we need to concentrate on whether when we're giving is, is this gift an act of worship that signifies my dependency on God. The significance of the widow's penny is that it was all that she had. So as we continue to reflect on giving, Pastor, how much do you want me to give? How much should I give? What's the percentage? What's the magic number? What's going to get me blessed? How? St. Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Give what you have decided in your heart to give. Our giving to God is an act of worship. I guess have a conversation this week. <coughs> that stuck right here, it's getting thicker and thicker. I'm gonna have a conversation this week with somebody who's talking about our act of worship. When we come on Sunday morning, this is an act of worship. Consider everything we do as an act of worship to God. You know, acts of worship were really scrutinized, and I, I know that, you know, maybe I'm going into some Old Testament um, law issues here, but there was a reason why Jesus, it was necessary for Jesus to come and to live perfectly because it required, uh, there required a perfect sacrifice, one that was clean of all blemish to be sacrificed on our behalf. Oftentimes, I'll be honest, I forget that and I don't always give God my very best. I want us to be reminded not only in our gifts of offering, but even in our acts of worship, in our service to the church, in coming here on Sunday morning, am I giving God my very best? 
when I make an appointment with Rachel to go to dinner at 7 p.m., she expects me to be there at 7 p.m. And you know what? I make sure I'm ready beforehand. I get dressed, I put a little clone on, maybe I get a rose, like, right? I make an appointment with my wife. I'm gonna keep it with her. I'm gonna do my very best. You know, Rachel, Rachel and I, we both love Chick-fil-A, so that's our fancy restaurant in town. <laughs> but if, you know, right, like if there were, maybe we go to steakhouse, you, know, you think about the best, you go to the best, you go to, I wanna encourage you guys, on Sunday morning, we're coming with an appointment to meet with God, that we should come with our best. We should be here, man, early, ready, to meet with God because we got an appointment with him at 10 o'clock. Not only have we set, a, set aside something for, for him, but, but I believe he's ordained this time for us too. Okay, so I want to the topic of what our offering and gifts look like. No, everything we do is an act of worship to God. Let's present ourselves to him holy and pure and a sacrifice and offering that is worth his sacrifice for us. So how much should you give? I want to encourage you one study scripture. But secondly, decide in your heart what you should give. You should be giving Make a decision based off of or signifying your act of worship and dependence on God. What I see from this story of the widow giving two pennies is that nothing is too much. Oftentimes we focus on what is the minimum. I reflect on nothing is too much. God deserves it all. And if I fudge on the numbers and I accidentally give a bigger gift than what I intended to give, I've got to believe that God is still able, just as he provided me initially with the gift, that he's able to provide and sustain me after the gift. Because if I look at scripture, there are some percentages, there are some the habits of, of first fruits, the best, the last golden, crispy, Chick-fil-A fry, right? And that's the gift God desires. That's the gift God deserves. It's the best portion. Stop stepping on my own shoes. <laughs> we should be people that give gifts that reflect our gratitude and dependence on God. I don't know about you this morning, but as I again reflected on these passages, I said, God, help me. I don't want to be known as somebody that is possessed by my possessions. I don't want to be known as somebody that would hold back from giving you worship. So I found myself over and over again as I reflected on these scriptures. Be as generous as you were to me. How many of you in the room, raise your hands this morning, we'll do this. How many of you will say, God, help me be as generous as you've been to me? Think this is a prayer <coughs> that God would want us to pray, but also that he would want to help us and to give us the grace to be a people who are generous with our gifts. Why don't we stand this morning?